It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Dr. Peter Hurst, Executive Director, MIT Sloan Executive Education. Dr. Hurst, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the next in our Innovation at Work webinar series from the MIT Sloan School of Management. I'm looking out of the window. It's kind of a cold, snowy day here in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I hope wherever you are in the world that uh, you're enjoying slightly better weather than we are. Uh, but looking back inside the room, I'm really delighted to be sitting here with Professor Duncan uh, Semester, who is uh, the NTU Chair of Management Science and Professor of Marketing uh, at the MIT Sloan School. We have, uh, at last count, over 1,500 people from all over the world who have registered uh, for the day's webinar uh, to hear from uh, Duncan on understanding the customer decision process, uh, why good products fail. Duncan is uh, quite a specialist in uh, really applying economics and operations research to the practice of, of marketing uh, and strategy. And that's actually a really interesting intersection of, of, of skills. And so we're very thrilled uh, that Duncan has come today to speak with us in this webinar. Uh, Duncan is a PhD from MIT. He's taught in the past at the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business, uh, and he's really one of our most accomplished uh, professors in, in uh, the executive education program as well, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, later. You are uh, able to ask questions throughout the, uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, I will be monitoring those, and uh, we'll, we'll ask Duncan some questions perhaps as we go along, and certainly at, at the end of his presentation as well. We also have a Twitter feed going, uh, hashtag MITWebinar, uh, and certainly would welcome anybody uh, posting your thoughts and observations to the Twitter feed as well. So with that, it's my pleasure to hand over to uh, Professor Duncan Semester. Duncan. Thank you, Peter. Welcome, everybody. This is, uh, this is a good topic. This is a great topic. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about today is not how to use customer information to design good products. No, it's a, it's a different topic. It's once we've got a good product, how do we make sure customers are going to buy them? So too often we see firms doing a great job with engineering and a great job of innovation. They design a product. It's going to add a lot of value to customers, and customers simply don't purchase it. So underlying this, so the key point we're going to make is firms too often don't think about how customers make purchasing decisions. So we think as engineers, we think about what customers' needs are, we think about whether this product is going to satisfy the need, but what we don't think about is how a customer is going to collect information and how they're going to make a purchasing decision. And so if they don't recognize the benefits of the product, they won't buy it, even though there may be big benefits for them. So to look at this topic, we're going to survey what we know about the customer decision process. And we're going to do it in three steps. We're going to talk first and spend quite a lot of time talking about how customers search for information. And the answer is going to be different in different markets. It's going to be different over time as customers gain more expertise too. So we'll spend, I'll make three points about searching for information. We'll spend a little bit of time on that. The second topic is the inference process. And what does that mean? That means that customers, when they can't search, they make it up. It turns out that they'll use the observable information that they can see to infer the stuff that they can't see. And so this is going to be very important. Uh, we'll spend some time talking about the inference process. I'll start with some examples, and we'll talk about why that's important for the innovation process. <clears throat> so the third topic we're going to talk about is the purchasing decision itself. And so given customers have either searched for information to guide their purchasing decision, or where they can't search, they've formed inferences, now they need to make a decision, which invariably means trade-offs. So you can't have, typically you can't have great quality and low prices. Or if you're buying a car, you can't have you know, good fuel economy and lots of horsepower. Invariably there are trade-offs, and as a firm we'd like to understand how customers are going to make those trade-offs. So we'll spend a little bit of time about that topic. And in particular, we'll talk about the fact that customers don't always behave consistently. They'll say one thing and then do something which is quite different, and we'll talk about why. 
Good, so three topics, search, forming inferences, and then the actual purchasing decision. And we're going to use this to explain why it is that good products fail. Products that should generate value for customers don't get purchased. Good, so first, customer search. Search for information. And so, I'll try and use some examples which are custom examples, and I'll also try and use some business-to-business -business examples as we go through this. So I'm going to make three points about search, and the first point you're going to feel comfortable with. I'm going to, it's, it's, you know, it's going to feel familiar, you're going to nod, you're going to think, okay, good, that makes sense. The second point's going to be a bit more surprising, and the third point's a little bit more worrying. So the first point is the amount of search customers do is a function of the cost and benefit of search, and that has to be true. So I was reading, just the other day, I was reading that United is, is going to buy 150 planes from Boeing at a cost of about $15 billion. Now how long would that search process be? How long would it take United to make that purchasing decision? You know, is it a week? No. I mean, is it, is it a year? It's probably longer than a year. It's probably 18 months to two years. What's that mean? Well, that's a long procurement process. That's a lot of search. And what are they searching for? They're identifying what the alternatives are in the market, and they're comparing the characteristics of those alternatives. Good. Okay, what about, what about buying a house? Can we buy a house on the weekend? Well, we should try not to. Uh, we'll make some bad decisions. C can we buy a car on a weekend? Yeah, but you've got to take it for a test drive. Right, search. Note that there are, it's often that search is very important, so the benefit of information is high, but it's just too costly to collect, and so we don't do so. And my favorite example of this is taxis in New York. So, and this is a very worrying fact. It turns out that uh, about 40% of the taxis on the road in New York have an injury accident each year. I mean, somebody gets injured. So what does that mean? Well, that means when you fly to New York and you arrive at whichever airport, if you arrive at LaGuardia, you're walking out of the terminal, and it's very important that you find a safe taxi driver. Okay, so the benefit of information is high, right, because of your personal safety. What are you going to do? What you're going to do is go to the first taxi at the front of the line. Why? Because the cost of search is simply too high. At a minimum, you should walk around the taxis and see if you see any big dents, particularly big dents around the passenger compartment. Uh, but, you know, how much search do we do? We don't do a lot, even though the benefit is, in principle, pretty high. Good. So the first point is the amount of search customers do when purchasing a product is a function of the cost and benefit of searching. And that should feel good, right? You should you hear that and nod and think, okay, that makes sense. So the second point is the amount of search we do is a function of our prior expertise. Right, so the amount of search we do is a function of our prior expertise. And I have a, a figure here that we're going to use to illustrate that. And so on the x-axis, on the bottom there, we've got the amount of prior expertise that the customer has. And on the other axis, we have the amount of search that customers engage in. And I want you to think for a moment about what that relationship looks like. Because when I show it to you, you're going to be surprised. At least I was surprised when I discovered this. And so this is something which has been, been heavily studied over the last ten, five to ten years or so. We understand this relationship very well, and it's, as I said, it's somewhat surprising. I think when I first thought about this, I probably thought that the people on the left who have the least prior expertise do the most searching. Why? because they don't know anything and they need to go and find out. You know, in order to make a good purchasing decision, they need to go out and do some search. Well, it turns out that that's not right. The relationship looks like this. So it's an inverted U. Uh, and let's think a little bit about it. The people on the far right, with the little circle there, who are those people? They are the experts. They're the experts. Why do the experts not search? Because they think they already know. And let me emphasize the think they already know. 
So this is a problem, right? So these people often don't search enough because they think they already know the answers. And if customers aren't searching, they're not going to discover your new innovation. Let me give you an example. About, ooh, about two years ago, I was doing work with a pharmaceutical company, and they had a drug approved by the FDA in a new therapeutic area. And so it was, it was a disease that was a painful disease. The previous treatment uh, was somewhat effective but had bad side effects. This new drug will be very effective and fewer side effects. In other words, it's going to create a lot of value for the customers, or in this case, the patients. And so they launch the drug after the FDA approves it, and what happens? Nothing. In other words, the doctors wouldn't prescribe the new drug. Why is it? Well, it turns out that the doctors, when a patient turned up with this disease, the doctors had been prescribing the same thing for 30 years. They were experts. They knew that if a patient turned up with these symptoms, this is what the solution is. And because they were experts, they didn't bother to look around to investigate new options. Big challenge for the drug company. Note the problem for the drug company is not that they didn't develop a good product. The big problem for the drug company is can customers recognize the value that's created? Good, so let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Who's at the other end of the spectrum? Well, these are the people with no prior expertise. These people are clueless. And they're going to remain clueless because they're not searching. And so why don't these people search? Because you'd think in many respects they have the greatest need for information and they should be most motivated to go out and do some, some search. Well, the answer is they don't have enough expertise to know which questions to ask, where to go to get the information, and if they get the information, they can't interpret it. Let me give you an example. So some time ago, actually some time ago, because it was before I, mar I was married, and that, or I am married, and that, that's going to be relevant to this story. Uh, I had a call from a friend one Saturday morning, and she wanted to go and buy a bicycle. She wanted to go and buy a new bicycle. And so she knew nothing about bicycles. So what does she do? Well, what do we do when we lack expertise? We seek help, right? That's why we go to a doctor to interpret our symptoms. That's why we go to a financial advisor to help with our financial decisions. That's why we go to an insurance broker to help with our insurance decisions. So she needed bike help. She needed to buy a bicycle, knew nothing about it. So she had an excellent strategy, seek help. Very poor implementation of that strategy, though, because I know nothing about bicycles. It was going to be the blind leading the blind. However, my friend was a very attractive friend, and I was very reluctant to admit I knew nothing about bicycles. I said, yes, that is an excellent idea. We went off to buy a bicycle. We get to the bike store, and an excellent salesman came up to us, and we explained what we were doing at the bike store. My friend was here to buy a bike, and I was here to guide the bicycle purchasing decision. And he looked at me, and he started talking at me. And he thought, well, here's somebody who can interpret the information. I'm going to provide a lot of technical information to Duncan. So he started telling me about the different parts, and he started telling me about these different alloys. I was good with pedals, pedals and handlebars, no problem. But he was talking about parts of bikes I didn't know existed. No information was being received. It was being provided, but it wasn't being received. After about 20 minutes, my friend's eyes are completely glazed over. She turns around, she looks the salesman in the eye, and she says, I want a red bike. 20 minutes later, we walk out of that store with a red bike. So I want you to think about that transaction. If the bike manufacturers had invested in innovation around product features, would that have affected our purchasing decision? No. No. Even though they may have created value for us, we had too little expertise to discover the value that they created. 
A couple of things to note. This was predictable before they start the product development process. It's no good discovering this after you've done your R&D. What else? The amount of search that customers are going to do is going to be different for different customer segments. It may also vary over time. So when they first, companies first, you know, IBM in particular, first started coming out with personal computers, the customers knew nothing about them. Now most customers have the expertise to search. It's very hard to get information about computers other than online. You know, we don't go into specialized computing stores anymore. We simply buy them online because customers are so good at searching. So that decision process and the way customers collect information will change over time. Typically, customers become more informed over time. Typically, B2B customers are more informed than end consumers. Not always, of course. Good. So two points so far about search. We've talked about the cost and benefit of search. And notice with the cost and benefit, it's not the actual benefit of customers searching, it's their perception of the benefit of searching. In other words, there may be an important benefit, right? There may be a good news solution for them, but if they don't perceive that that's the case, they see no point in searching, they won't. The second point we made about search so far is that really it's a function of your prior expertise. And so the people who don't search are the people who have a lot of expertise and think they already know, and the people at the other end of the spectrum who don't have enough expertise to know what questions to ask, where to go for the information, or how to interpret it when it comes in. Good. The third point I want to make about search is really relevant for the experts, the people on the right-hand end of this figure. Why? Well, the point I want to make about these folks is that their search process is often distorted by biases. So they use their prior expertise to guide their search process. They tend to notice things that are consistent with their prior expectations. They tend to reinterpret information so that it's more consistent with our prior expectations. And we tend to remember things that are consistent with our, our prior beliefs. In other words, once people have formed strong beliefs, it's very hard to change them. Now, we really need a shock to, the, to their system to change them. I'll point out that these biases are not just true of customers deciding which products to purchase. They're also true of managers' own decision making. So as, we, as managers go through a product development process, one of the challenges they face is how are they collecting and interpreting information as it comes in? If information suggests the product won't succeed, what do we see the managers doing? Either ignoring it, reinterpreting it, or forgetting it. On the other hand, information that reinforces their view that this is a great product, oh, they love that information. We pay more attention to it. You know, we tend to remember it. If anything, we elaborate on it. So these distortions, while they're true of customers in their search process, particularly those with a lot of prior expertise, they're also true of managers as we manage the product development process. Good. So let me pivot away from search. Made three points about the cost and benefit of search, about the role of prior expertise, and these distortions. Now I want to think about what customers do when they can't search or they don't have the expertise to do so. I want to talk about the inference process. Good. And so... I'll remind you what I said about what inferences are. It's customers using information that they can see, observable cues, if you like, to infer the unobservable information, in this case, unobservable product features. And so I have a, a McDonald's logo there to remind me to give you a, a McDonald's example. And so I mean, it's interesting to think about McDonald's, very well-run company. I mean, that, you think you're a commodity business, but they're selling French fries and hamburgers, and they're doing a great job of it and making great money and really competing effectively against a large number of competitors. Very well-run company. I once had the opportunity to see a senior manager from McDonald's give a talk. I think it was here at MIT. 
And he said a couple of things, which were, he said a lot of things that were interesting, but one that I'm going to share with you is he said, we tell our store owners, our franchisees, we tell them it's really important to keep the parking lots clean. And I heard that and I thought, really? Okay, you know, okay, it's better, maybe better to have a clean parking lot than not, but the customers really care. And he said, I know what you're thinking. It was exactly what I was thinking. And he said, what do you really care about? Is it how clean the parking lot is? No. What you really care about is how clean the kitchen is, how clean the restaurant is, perhaps how clean the restrooms are. But as you're driving past, making a decision about where to stop, stop for lunch, what can you see? You can see the parking lot. In other words, you use the observable thing, the cleanliness of the parking lot, to infer the unobservable information the cleanliness of the kitchen or the cleanliness of the restrooms. Perfect example, right? Using observable product features to infer unobservable product features. He also said something else. He said, well, we do think the cleanliness of the parking lot contains information about the cleanliness of the kitchen and it's probably due to the quality of the restaurant manager. Right? A good restaurant manager keeps them both clean. So there's some logic to it. He said, I don't think customers are going through that logic. They're trying to work out where to have a hamburger. They're not thinking about the quality of the management of the restaurant. He said, the reason we think this is such a powerful cue is not because customers are thinking about this in some conscious way. He said, in fact, customers think about it in a subconscious way. In other words, they drive past the parking lot, they look at it and they think, you know, I just don't feel good about stopping here. They couldn't necessarily tell you why, but I just don't feel good about stopping here. I think we can look for somewhere else. In other words, over time, they've learned to form an association between the cleanliness of the parking lot and the cleanliness of the kitchen. And that's now operating at their subconscious. Very powerful. Once something operates at your subconscious, incredibly powerful. The point is this inference process is very prevalent. It's very widespread, it's very common, and it's a very strong influence on customers' purchasing decisions. So what are the two most common cues that customers use to evaluate quality? Well, the two most common cues they use are the price, and I will tell you that price and quality are inextricably linked in customers' eyes. High price, high quality. Low price, low quality. Very strong relationship in customers' eyes. So what's the other cue that's the most common use cue customers use to infer quality? It's the brand. Right, very important. You know, in many markets, particularly business-to-business -business markets, it's really the only role of the brand is an observable cue we use to infer quality. So, that then tells us when a brand is going to be more important. In other words, which markets should we invest more in the brand in and which should we invest less in? Well, we should invest more in the brand if customers are actually going to use the brand to make their purchasing decisions. So now think about what I've said about search and think about what I've said about inference. So if customers can't search either because the cost of search is too high or the perceived benefits too low or perhaps they lack the expertise, what are they pretty quickly going to turn to? They're going to turn to the brand. In other words, in markets where customers can't search, those are markets in which we should be investing heavily as a firm in our brand. On the other hand, if customers can search easily, it's a low cost of doing so, they can interpret the information that comes in, perhaps they can interpret the spec sheet, and, the in and searching for the spec sheet is easy. What does that mean? Well, it means two things about the role of the brand. One, customers won't use the brand in their purchasing decision. 
And secondly, their perceptions of the brand will change quickly because of information coming in. Let me restate that. Let me summarize that again. A very important point. You know, a very important role of the brand is as an observable cue customers use to form inferences about quality. When a customer is going to do that, well, when they have to do that because they can't search, perhaps because the cost of search is too high, or perhaps because they don't have the expertise to interpret the information. In those types of markets, the brand will be very important in the purchasing decision, plus their perception to the brand will be very sticky. They will persist because there's no new information coming in to change customers' brand perceptions. On the other hand, in markets where customers can search for information, they will do so and they won't use the brand. For example, if I was to go out this afternoon and want to buy a new laptop computer, and I'm looking for a laptop computer with lots of hard disk memory space. I want a really big hard drive on this computer. Well, let me contrast the two ways of making that purchasing decision. In one case, I can search the spec sheet. I can look, for example, on the Dell website and see how big the hard drive is on the different computers. Search. Search looking on the spec sheet. The alternative would be, I'm not going to search. I'm just going to use the brand as an inference. That would be like saying, I'm going to buy a Dell because Dell computers have big hard drives. Crazy talk. Crazy talk. Don't do that. And there's a market where the customers can search. They should search. They shouldn't be using the brand to form inferences about quality, particularly those quality features that they can search on. Good. Great. Well, thanks, Duncan. That's a, that, that's a really great uh, introduction, and we've been getting a few questions coming in as, as, as you've been speaking. And actually, on, on that last uh, point, um, so I'm interested in if the Internet, how is the Internet affecting customers' ability to search? The, and I think the assumption in a lot of these questions is there's a lot more data out there. The, uh, it's easier for customers to search. Uh, yet, at the same time, uh, example, for example, uh, in the auto industry, we still see huge investments in, uh, in, in brand marketing. And so, if, if there is this ability to search, why is, isn't that a, is that a paradox? What's going on there? Nice. Yeah, this, is a, this is a great question. And so, about 10 years ago, well, I guess 14 years ago now, you know, the, the Internet's in its nascent days, in its early days, and and as academics, we were all, we knew it was going to be a big thing. And so we were all thinking about this question. Uh, and I think initially we overestimated the role of the Internet. But th here, were, here was how we were thinking about it to begin with. It was, okay, now customers are going to be able to look for information, search for information on the Internet. And that's going to lower the customer's cost of search. As a result, we're going to see customers doing more search. That search is going to be driving their purchasing decisions. That's really going to diminish the value of the brand. Logic's great. Theory's great. Some markets, some product categories clearly happened. Books, travel, no question. Things changed. But a lot of product categories and a lot of markets, not a lot happened. Why? Because customers didn't use the Internet as much as we expected. And a, a big reason for that was, particularly in consumer markets, was the Internet wasn't present when customers were actually making purchasing decisions in stores or in the marketplace. You actually had to be in front of a computer and able to do the search. So where we've actually seen a bigger impact has been in recent years with smartphones. Now our customers have access to the Internet and the ability to search at the point of purchase. And that's, if anything, had a, a much bigger impact than the, perhaps the Internet alone. Uh, I think, I think there's, a, there's something else to be said here, too, and, and I've mentioned the spec sheet. Let me come back to this point. So at a simple level, we can search on the spec sheet and we find it very hard to search on things that are not on the spec sheet. 
So when buying that Dell laptop, I can search on the size of the hard drive, but it's much harder to search on reliability or ease of use. And so in most markets, what do we see happening? We see that the particularly B2B markets, but a lot of consumer markets, customers go out, they search, they discover the spec sheet, and the brand doesn't play an important role there. On the other hand, customers also care about off-spec sheet product features, like reliability and ease of use. So in the past, it's been very hard to search on those features, and so that's where the role of the brand has been particularly prominent, around off-spec sheet product features. You know, nobody ever gets fired for buying IBM. What they're really saying is, okay, search the spec sheet to work out what the features are, but then use the IBM brand to reassure you about reliability and ease of use. Great. Clear logic. On the spec sheet, search. Off the spec sheet, form inferences. So the Internet has changed this equation a little bit as well because of the access to product reviews. And product reviews essentially make off-spec sheet product features, so things like reliability and ease of use, you make that searchable. So now you can search on reviews about your restaurant, about which restaurant you're going to choose tonight. What's that going to do? It's going to diminish the role of the restaurant's brand around those off-spec sheet items. So the answer, it's a long answer to a great question. You know, we think that the role of the Internet is to make search easier for customers. Initially, we thought it would just be access to spec sheet items. And unquestionably, with smartphones and the Internet, it really has done that. But in recent years, even the off-spec sheet items, things in the past like that are very hard to search on, like reliability, have become searchable because of product reviews. Peter. Great. Thanks, Duncan. Sort of following on, actually, from that explanation, uh, people began asking about, so what is the role of, uh, of information gathering from peers, uh, and also what's the role of uh, the importance of trust? Yes. Okay. So this is an area we've done quite a lot of research. It's a little bit unrelated to what we're talking about today, but it's, it's well, certainly relevant to the customer decision process. And that is... Hmm. It turns out that far fewer people write product reviews than we realize. So we do work with a, a very big private label retailer, and we look at how many of their customers who purchase their products actually write product reviews, and the answer is about 1.5%. So for every 1,000 customers, there's about 15 people writing reviews. And actually, we discovered that one of those 15 people are writing reviews never having purchased the product, even though they may claim in their review to have done so. So we have a tiny tail of the customers writing reviews. Is that important? Well, if they were representative of the customer base, then maybe the tiny tail doesn't really, the fact that it's such a small proportion doesn't matter. But the answer is they're not representative of the customer base. People who write reviews tend to be much more price sensitive, and they also tend to purchase niche items, not the mainstream items. And so that's a worry. Why? Because a tiny proportion of people are writing the reviews. Those people aren't representative. But the other 985 out of 1,000 people, their purchasing decisions are being influenced by those reviews. So there's an increasing amount of research going on right now looking at why is that why are the reviewers so not representative, and do their reviews actually help or hurt in different markets? You know, if their views are not representative and people are following them, then perhaps people aren't making better purchasing decisions. Great, great. You know, uh, and one set of questions that just came in, which may, may uh, I suspect, feed onto your next uh, your next slides as well. Uh, earlier in the talk, you, you you started out by talking about uh, the innovation. Uh, in, in products, and was that actually relevant to the customer uh, decision process? So a lot of the people who uh, joined this webinar, given that we're at MIT, are very interested in, in innovation. And what's the message for them here? Yeah. Nice. Good. So we start an innovation process, 
And the danger is we just think, are we creating a product that's going to satisfy a customer's needs? And so the key message here is that is not enough. Simply satisfying customers' needs is not enough if customers don't recognize that the product will satisfy their needs. What we need to think about is how are customers going to collect information when they make their purchasing decisions? Will they search? And we now know that's going to be a function of the cost and benefit of search and also their prior expertise. If they don't search, what are they going to do? They're going to form inferences. So if you have invested in innovation, like our bike manufacturer, and customers aren't going to discover that innovation, then you're not going to get a return on it. So too often we see firms who have invested in innovation and they've done a good job. They've come up with products that really would help customers, but customers never know and those products never succeed. Is that because the firms have failed to do their marketing in the way they should have, or is there something more fundamental at work there? Yeah, I think that I think perhaps in past years what we would teach was just to teach firms not just to think about the engineering, but to also think about customer needs. And so now, so and, and a lot of firms have heard that message, and there's the product development process in most firms has systems and controls in place to make sure that we're paying attention to does this satisfy a customer need or not? What we're now seeing is firms don't have systems and procedures in place to make sure that we're thinking about how will customers recognize whether this satisfies their needs. So an additional level of sophistication, not only what are customers' needs, but how do customers learn about the product features and make decisions about whether it will satisfy their needs. If they're not searching, you're going to have a problem. Right? It doesn't matter how good your new bicycle component is, if people are choosing a bike because it's red, or they're choosing a bike because it's got a brand on it they recognize, then your investments in R&D will, will not generate a return. Okay, so the third, so we've talked about two topics so far. We've talked about search, and we talked about inferences. And so customers have either searched for information or where they couldn't search, they've formed inferences. They've used the observable stuff to infer the unobservable stuff. Okay, so now they're ready to make a purchasing decision. And that's the final topic I would like to talk about. And the point I want to discuss here is a point that's been a huge topic of research in, in recent years, and that is there's tremendous evidence now that the way customers make purchasing decisions, in particular the way they trade off different product features, is not very stable. Customers often behave inconsistently. What do I mean? Well, if I give them a choice between two different products, and a lot of them choose the first product. I've got product A and product B, and say 60% of people choose product A. I can change the context, and I'll give you some examples in a moment. I can change the purchasing context in a way that seems irrelevant to the purchasing decision, and now customers make a different decision. Instead of purchasing product A, now people start choosing product B. And it looks like people, customers are behaving in a way that is not in their best interests. Uh, it looks like customers behaving badly. You know, if you like product A, you should keep buying product A. So for seemingly irrelevant reasons, they change what they're buying. And I'm going to demonstrate this to you with two examples. And the first example is perhaps the most famous example of this. Danny Kahneman, who's a professor at Princeton, won the Nobel Prize for this. And it's often called the mug experiment. And I want you to imagine that there's a, there's a large room of people, and half of the people, all the people on the left-hand side of the room, when they walked in, got a new mug. In this case, an MIT coffee mug. Lucky people. The other half of the room, the right-hand side of the room, no mug. Okay. So then I ask everybody in the room the same question. I ask them, how much do you value the mug? In other words, for the people on the left, who I did give a mug to, I asked them, how much, would you, how much do I have to pay you 
to buy the, buy, buy the mug back. How much are you, do you need to, in order to be willing to sell the mug? The people on the right-hand side of the room who didn't get a mug, I asked, obviously, how much are you willing to pay to buy a mug? Well, the answer should be the same, because I'm really asking them, how much do you value the mug? It turns out the average answer is never the same. Do the people on the left who've got the mug will pay three times more than the people on the right? Well, they want three times more to sell it than the people on the right are willing to pay to buy it. So it's very famous. This, is, this study has been replicated thousands of times. It's been done in many, many different countries. Uh, it turns out people of different ages essentially were born with this trait. And the trait is, is, is called loss aversion. So the people on the left, what I'm really asking them is, how much do you need to be compensated for the loss of a mug, of your mug? People on the right don't interpret it as a loss. They're, they're really being asked, how much are you willing to pay in order to gain a mug? So half of them interpret it as a loss, half of them interpret it as a gain, and losses speak much louder to us than gains. So why is this important? Well, it's important because as a firm, if you understand this, you can take advantage of it. And I, I heard a great example of this. Uh, it's one of my favorite examples. It's, it's really about buying cars. And so when our MBA students graduate each year, the first thing they purchase, new car. And so what, what model car do they buy? Most of them go and buy a BMW. What color BMW do they buy? Black. And they think they're the only one doing so, but they're going to buy a black BMW. BMW dealers love June when our students graduate. Okay, so they've just taken a course in negotiation, and so they're, they're there, they've gone to the BMW dealer. They remember what I said, you've got to take it for a test drive. They go out for a test drive, do a little bit more search. They come back, they're negotiating the price, they're getting pretty close to a deal, and then they remember their negotiation course. And they say to the, to the car salesperson, they say, I think I'm going to go to another dealer I'm going to search some more on price to see if I can get a lower price. I'm going to invest in some more search. And what's the car salesperson going to say? Here's what they're going to say. They're going to say, I tell you what, why don't you take the car home over the weekend? Take it home over the weekend. On Monday, if you like the car, we'll come in and complete the transaction. If you don't like the car, no problem, we'll just switch you back into your old car. I mean... How good a deal is that? What a nice guy this car salesman is. The problem is what happened over the weekend. On Monday morning, everything's changed. On Monday morning, the question is, how much am I willing to pay to keep my car? How much am I willing to pay to give up having to lose my, to avoid having to give up my car? In other words, we're going to interpret it as a loss instead of interpret it as a gain. Our willingness to pay, as the mug experiment demonstrates, will explode. Hmm. Now you know this from this webinar, are you going to be safe on Monday morning? No, you are toast. Why? Because your valuation for the car really has changed. Whatever you do, do not take the car home over the weekend. Okay, so that's our first example. Second example is actually a study I was a little bit involved in, and I think at the end of the webinar I'm going to give you the reference for this. So we auctioned off some Boston Red Sox tickets. We did it here at MIT with the MBA students. And, uh, and as you could imagine, Given the tremendous strength of the Boston Red Sox, everybody wanted to go to the game. And so half of the people were told they had to pay by cash, and half of the people were told they had to pay by credit card. And the people who had to pay by cash got, I can't remember how long it was, maybe two weeks to pay. So there was no, you know, they had plenty of time to pay. They didn't have to have the cash with them. So the average cash bid was less than half of the average credit card bid. Huh. A seemingly irrelevant change to the purchasing context, 
really impacted people's willingness to pay. Okay, so we so I, I described the study once to to a class I was teaching, and in the class there was there was a gentleman who was in charge of marketing for a direct mail firm. He heard about this, and that afternoon he set up a study in the Economist magazine, and they had their their regular advertisement in the Economist magazine. Half of the people in the U.S. who got the Economist that week saw their advertisement. In the bottom right-hand corner, there was a little coupon, and they put the credit card logos on the, credit, on, the, on the coupon. Very small, almost inconspicuous. The other half of the people in the U.S. who got the Economist that week had exactly the same ad. The only difference was they replaced the logos of the credit cards with the words Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover. Very small difference, you know, unobtrusive. Did it have an impact? Yes, the credit card logos drove up revenue, drove up orders by 28%. 28%. If you think about it, everybody's ordering by credit card. There was no new information from having the logos or the words. Instead, a seemingly irrelevant change in the context really drove customers' purchasing decisions. So we can ask, why is this important? Well, it's important for two reasons. Two reasons. The good news is, and there's a good and a bad reason. The good news is, think about the, the BMW example. If you can change the context in a way that's favorable, you can make your products appear more attractive. The bad news is, that when we engage in the innovation process, we go out and measure customers' preferences. We measure how they're going to make trade-offs. Are they going to prefer fuel economy over horsepower, for example? And we measure their preferences in one context. If that context is even slightly different from the context in which they're going to make their purchasing decision, then we're not going to predict very accurately what their purchasing outcome is going to be. In other words, this, the fact that the context changes their decisions makes our market research inaccurate. It's a big source of error in our market research. And many of you will recall you know, examples in your past of, you know, we, we went out and asked customers what they wanted. We built something that they wanted, and then they just didn't purchase it. Well, we've talked today about some reasons for that. You know, one reason for it is they didn't discover that this product was satisfying their needs because of the way they collect information. The other reason is if we collect that information in one context and they make their purchasing decisions in a different context, well, now they're going to make different decisions. Seemingly irrelevant changes to the purchasing context can have a big impact on customers' decisions. Good. So let me quickly summarize, and then I think we're going to have a short period of time for some questions. So we talked about three topics. We talked about the search process, and I made three points there. One around the cost and benefit of search. Secondly, around prior expertise. And third, around the distortions, the, how customers' prior expertise interprets what information they see, how they interpret it, and, and whether they recall it. Good. So if customers can't search, what do they do? They form inferences. They use the observable information to infer the unobservable stuff. That means if we've innovated around product features that customers ought to care about, but they don't have the expertise, or they don't perceive there's a benefit of searching, or the cost of searching is too high, they simply won't discover those innovations. And they won't affect their purchasing decisions. It's not that you're not developing good products, it's just that customers can't recognize it. Final topic we talked about was the way customers make purchasing decisions is very dependent on the purchasing context. I change the context, customers make different decisions. That's great if we can change the context to make our products look more attractive. It's bad if we're trying to predict how they will behave. Because if we measure their needs or measure their preferences or measure how they're going to make trade-offs in one context 
And that context is different from the context in which they actually purchase, well, then they'll make different decisions. And our efforts to innovate and satisfy their needs will be disappointing. There will be a disappointing return. Good. Great. Th thank you, Duncan. I think that answered some of the questions that were coming up uh, as well. But there were a few. You touched a couple of times on possibly the differences between B2C and B2B. Uh, behaviors and just to amplify a little bit some of the questions that we're getting around that it, does the uh, advent of more formal procurement uh, processes in the B2B setting uh, change any of what you've just described uh, and perhaps at the same time you could reflect a little bit more on uh, how, how service of service products might differ from other kinds of products in this respect good 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 so the study of procurement is really the study of search Right? It's really the procurement process, a well-designed procurement process has a disciplined and structured approach to search, that first topic that we talked about. And so it's a careful evaluation of what's the cost of collecting information versus the perceived benefit of doing so. You know, the bigger the benefit, the bigger the transaction, the more we're going to search. And the procurement process is designed to force us to search. You know, we need to get three bids for transactions over, I think at MIT, if we purchase anything over $10,000, we need three bids. In other words, the procurement process is forcing us to invest in the cost of search to gain information because the perceived benefit of it is high enough. Of course, that procurement process is allergic to using brands. It really wants to force customers, or force our decision making to be based on search instead of being based on inference. However, no matter how disciplined and structured the procurement process, sometimes the cost of search is simply too high, the information's not available, or there's not enough expertise to evaluate it. There, we are going to use inferences. Even in a well-defined or well-structured procurement process, we prefer buying IBM than buying from some hitherto unknown brand. Right? But procurement is really about emphasizing the importance of search. Great. So the second question was about B2B versus B2C. No, about services. Services. Services, my mistake. Okay, services is great. It's another really nice example. Why? Because there's no spec sheet. So services has no spec sheet. In most services, there are no spec sheets. What does that mean? Very hard to search. It's going to mean the brand is hugely important. If you ask McKinsey and Company, the consulting firm, what's the consulting firm's most important strategic resources, the most important sources of differentiation? Their brand will loom large. Why? Because there's no spec sheet for consulting services, I mean, except in some rare, rare cases. And so without a spec sheet, it's very hard to search in any services market. No spec sheet, very hard to search, makes inferences terribly important, and will increase the prominence of the brand. Great, thank you. Maybe there's time for uh, one or two more questions before we have to uh, one or two more questions before we have to move on. Uh, just going back to something that was earlier in the uh, in, in your remarks, a few people are asking about this price quality uh, inference. Uh, and the, sometimes that seems to, to, to break down. And so, there will, uh, do you have any good examples of where, of where that doesn't hold? Yeah, they're hard, right? They're, they're, they're difficult. I mean, it's uh, you, you can think about Costco selling, you know, branded, high-end branded products, and you know they sell Dom Perignon at Costco. Well, there's a high-quality product being sold at a discount. It's still not cheap, though. Uh, it may be cheaper at Costco than it is at other places, but it's still not cheap. So it, it is hard to find examples where you know, high quality is associated with low cost. You, know, you think about services. If you lower your price, people perceive it's lower quality. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's almost inextricable in the customer's eyes. It also makes it very hard for a firm that in the past has targeted one end of the price quality spectrum and now finds itself needing to target the other end. So perhaps you've been the early innovator in a market 
You've been charging a big premium. The market has matured, perhaps because the technology has matured. It's become more competitive. You're associated with high prices. You may have trouble surviving once the product becomes commoditized. You know, you may need to exit, target other things, perhaps focus on services. So this relationship between price and quality, uh, it's hard to overstate the importance of it. We can find examples that are exceptions, but they almost prove the point because they're exceptions. Great. Thank you. And I think, Duncan, we're, we're just about out of time, so it just remains for me to make some uh, some closing remarks, if you could advance the slides, please. Uh, We've uh, provided here, thanks to Duncan, some further reading, and we will be just, uh, make these slides available uh, on our website after the end of the webinar, so you don't have to take notes too quickly now. Uh, and uh, just looking at these, Duncan mentioned uh, Daniel Kahneman as having done some of the uh, really foundational work and research, uh, and there are some other um, reading material and uh, an uh, academic paper that Duncan referred to uh, as, as well. Duncan also, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, teaches regularly in our executive education programs. Uh, and you can see here some of those that he's currently associated with. And we'd be very happy to uh, see some of you here at, at MIT and uh, to, to, to learn more from Duncan, who really just scratched the surface uh, in today's webinar, I think, in terms of what he, he goes into in, in his full courses uh, here at MIT. So just, as, just before thanking uh, Duncan, finally, I have one more question for him which he has about 30 seconds to answer, and that is uh, all these people who have been uh, listening to this webinar uh, today, wherever they are in the world, so what is one thing that when they uh, turn back to their desk uh, this afternoon or uh, maybe come back into work tomorrow morning, what's the one thing that you would recommend that they would do sort of learning from uh, what you've been talking about today? N nice. So instead of just thinking about will my product satisfy customers' needs, we need to think about how will customers know that my product is going to satisfy their needs. Are they going to search? Are they going to form inferences? How are we going to be a part of that decision process? Great. Thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, thank you all. As I mentioned, uh, the slides will uh, be available with the full audio um, soon on our website. Uh, and we look forward, hopefully, to seeing many of you again at the next in our Innovation at Work webinar series. And we'll be sending you information about that, too, in the near future. Thanks very much, Duncan. Thank you all. And thank you again to all our participants for joining us today. We hope you found this webcast presentation informative. This does conclude our webcast, and you may now disconnect. Have a great day.